Uh, finally, what we're really here for this evening is to hear our speaker, Kevin Blyer. Uh, he has an interesting and really fun uh, bio, but I'm going to read just a little bit of it because in looking at it, he is clearly much more interesting and much more entertaining than I am, and his voice is not hoarse. Um, but the short version is he is an Emmy winning, uh, Emmy award winning uh, writer for The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Um, he is also he's also written for uh, uh, for President Obama's uh, speeches at the Correspondents' Dinner for the past four years, I think. Um, he's written for uh, some other uh, very interesting shows and all sorts of good stuff. But as I said, I'm going to let him tell you all about the Constitution and uh, how we're going to rework it. I can't wait to hear it. We do have books uh, for sale afterwards. Uh, I'm already making my list, so um, he will be signing them. So if you are interested. Um, you can buy a book afterwards. He will sign it. We will have food and drinks afterwards, and I encourage you all to stay around, uh, talk, come up with your own amendments to the Constitution, whatever it is he encourages us to do. We're glad to have you all. No, 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 no. That is far too appropriate, apparently. <laughs> apparently. Now, I, I just have to say, I know they say everything is bigger in Texas, but that would certainly apply to this podium, wouldn't it? <laughs> Now, I realize I'm not a big man, I'm not a tall man, but I remind you, neither was James Madison, and he's the father of the Constitution. So at the very least, I've often said that I see only as far as I do with this project because I stand on the shoulders of short men. And between the two of us, <laughs> we can probably be a full-sized real person. Um, well, good evening, my fellow citizens. Um, now, you are still my fellow citizens, right? You haven't seceded quite yet. I know that... <laughs> I know that the night is young, so who knows what might happen. Um, you, I have to say this at the top. I, I assumed that this room would be amused by this. This is a true story. Just before I started this tour, I received this email from Doris Kearns Goodwin. And like I said, in this kind of room, that, 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 that's an egregious name drop, I realize. <laughs> well, Doris Kearns Goodwin just emailed me. Uh, and this is actually, <laughs> yeah, right? And this is literally what she said. She said, have fun. I'll be there in spirit, along with James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, which begs this word of caution. If any of you are sitting next to Alexander Hamilton or James Madison or their spirits, uh, let me know, um, because I'm actually told, and this is something I just learned recently, there is an animatronic LBJ somewhere around here that might protect us all. Um, I also love that her email, forgive me for taking a huge preface here, but her email uh, ends with eight exclamation points, and I can't help but think, she doesn't use that eight exclamation point method in any of her Pulitzer Prize winning histories. And that seems like an opportunity really to be missed. You know, she could say, they were a team of rivals. <laughs> she doesn't do it. Anyway, it is a special thrill to be here in Austin and especially here at the LBJ Library. Um, and it does seem appropriate on this occasion with you all staring at me expectantly and me standing at this huge podium that I say a few words, uh, not just on my behalf, but, uh, but on behalf of every free-thinking, freedom-loving American who has, as I say, has ever saluted a bald eagle, carved a giant face into a mountainside, or dreamed and dreamt of a place called democracy. Uh, my name is Kevin Blyer, and it is true what you've heard. I have rewritten the Constitution of the United States, single-handedly, with really no help from any of you people. I really could have appreciated that. <laughs> Uh, I'm exhausted. Uh, when I tell people that I've rewritten the Constitution, uh, what I off the question I often hear, either from their lips or just in my head, is, why, really, why'd you do that? Um, and it is a fair question, and there are any number of very good reasons why, beginning with this, good explanations. I had no choice. Uh, as you may have heard, Thomas Jefferson told me to. For it was Jefferson who said, and by the way, who I think we can all agree is one of the most foundry of our founding fathers. <laughs> um, he said, every constitution naturally expires at the end of 19 years. If it be enforced longer, is it, it is an act of force and not of right. Um, so by his math, and I'll take his math, uh, the US Constitution should have been rewritten 11, time, 11 times by now. It has been expired for over 200 years, dead, flatlined, kaput, an ex-parrot, you might say. His words, not mine. Um, so honestly, I actually feel bad that I'm just getting to it now. I've been slacking for over two centuries. Then again, Jefferson was over in Paris at the time when the delegates to the Constitutional Convention were doing the hard work of getting ready and preparing and writing that Constitution. So really, only they know how hard it is to write a Constitution, and now me. Um, now what's more, it would also seem that our Constitution needs a little bit of good publicity these days. In my research for this book, 
or as I like to call it, my me search. Um, oh yes, I've won Emmys, people, for that kind of <laughs> for that kind of wordplay. Um, I learned a few pretty astounding things about our founding document, uh, beginning with this. Twenty years ago, I think actually twenty-five years ago, of the 170 countries that then existed, a full 160 of them based their constitutions, at least in part, on our constitution. In the last 25 years, how many fledgling democracies look to our constitution as a model? Apparently, zero. <laughs> they look instead to South Africa and to, and this one is especially galling, Canada. <laughs> we are getting skunked by Canada, people. Um, this is apparently because other constitutions Right, care more, as they say, about, oh, I think it's like human rights, I guess, is what they say, and something called the, en the environ, environment. <laughs> environment, there it is. Um, and by the way, I was looking around earlier in the, in the uh, library here, and I, you gotta think that that's something Lady Bird Johnson would actually approve of, because I think the con every constitution might actually insist on a, a wildflower uh, research center. That's pretty cool, right? Um, and also, in fact, when Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was in Egypt a couple of months ago, she said that she would actually not look to the American Constitution if she were designing a democracy in 2012. Um, and I thought that was pretty interesting because if she's not willing to blindlessly, thoughtlessly cheerlead for the American Constitution, even though it is, she's got the robe, she's in, a, she's in the position to protect it, it's her job requirement, I thought, why can't I, despite being totally unqualified to do so, the only time I wear a robe is at the spa. Nonetheless, <laughs> why, then the question becomes, well, why rewrite the Constitution, rather than just point at it and say, hey guys, it's not so bad, right? It's not so bad. Why pile on with 300 pages pointing out where each and every article and each, for, each and every amendment goes wildly, admittedly comically, wrong? And actually, I begin the book with a, an anecdote from American history, which of course is the best kind of history, that might explain why. Um, I'll read it now. <clears throat> By the way, this is my bookmark. It's an occupational hazard. <laughs> I plucked this off a goose in Greece. True story. <clears throat> right there. I keep it right there on the front, yes. <clears throat> The question was, where do I keep it? And I thought that was really kind of a personal question. <laughs> so I punted and I just said, I keep it in the book. Uh, here's, here's how I begin to justify this entire enterprise. Their beloved bell was in jeopardy. It had hung dutifully for decades, peeling hourly from its steeple above the Pennsylvania State House, breaking the peace of the Philadelphia streets only to remind its citizens that time had marched on and all was well. But these were no longer peaceful times. It was 1777, a year after America had declared her independence from the British crown, and only days after her lion-hearted general, George Washington, had suffered a withering defeat at the Battle of Brandywine. All signs were that Philadelphia, the revolutionary capital, might well be the next to fall. Fearing that the king's men would melt any metal they found into British cannons, a few American patriots confiscated their own bell, soon to be known appropriately as the Liberty Bell, and hid it in the safest place they could find, under a pile of horse manure. <laughs> True story. The gambit worked. The marauding redcoats never got their British hands on our American liberty. The lesson learned back then rings as clear today. Sometimes, in order to save and honor something we cherish, we have to shit on it. Now, I admit, I have to say right here, I admit that I was a little worried whether it mightn't be appropriate to swear in a presidential library. <laughs> but then I realized this is the LBJ library. <laughs> I think he'd approve. Um, I hope that gives me the political cover to write this book. I also have to say that I was amused to see last week, you might have seen this too, that the maintenance crew, the caretakers at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, spent an entire day um, adding a protective shellac to the Liberty Bell. And I couldn't help but think 
knowing now where these American revolutionary soldiers and such had hid the Liberty Bell, they're about 240 years late on that piece of shellac. <laughs> anyway, uh, the last couple weeks people have also asked, where did you get the idea to rewrite the Constitution? I mean, that's a pretty crazy thing to do. Well, in my research, sorry, me search, I learned that actually I wasn't the first to do it. Um, someone just a little bit crazy had tried to do it decades before I had. And in fact, I should add that I first read about this someone in Sanford Levinson's book, your esteemed law professor in the area, who I believe might be here tonight. And well, Sandy, I th should thank you, because while the revelation that I wasn't the first did break my heart, <laughs> ultimately it did motivate me as well. And here's how. Here's a little story about this gentleman. Pay attention, this is important. A man named Rexford Guy Tugwell, who actually existed, and whose cartoonish name, therefore, I did not make up, spent the last 30 years of his life trying to rewrite the Constitution of the United States. Before his death in 1979, he composed 32 separate drafts of a revised Constitution, a new and improved set of guiding principles he hoped would be appropriate to the modern times, accepted by his government, and embraced by his nation. He failed. Although he completed his fool's errand and published his draft with a reputable publisher who frankly should have known better, it rhymes with Marper's Hagazine, his proposals were a little bit too nutballs for even the indulgent sensibilities of the 1970s. Replace the 50 states with 20 republics, elect the president to one nine-year term, add two branches of government, eliminate the Senate, rename the United States of America the New States of America. I know, nutballs, right? He had fooled many people, even presidents, for decades. Armed with a degree in agricultural economy from Wharton in the 1920s, Tugwell was a vocal and cherished part of FDR's so-called brain trust and served as an architect of the New Deal in, 19, in the 1930s. He was even featured on the cover of Time magazine in 1934. Then things got weird. Tugwell, a devotee of the literature of revolt and reconstruction, became the first and mercifully only head of FDR's notorious Resettlement Administration, a federal agency tasked with relocating the urban poor to the suburbs. Tugwell took to the gig like a pig to mud. It wasn't long before he and the agency were attacked for being socialist and utopian and just a little bit nutballs, something about a crazy notion to relocate the urban poor to the suburbs. There were other early signs of his lack of judgment, during a 1927 junket to the Soviet Union, Tugwell missed a six-hour meeting with Joseph Stalin because he lost track of time while touring a collective farm. To repeat, Tugwell was too busy studying communism to meet with Joseph Stalin. <laughs> then, apparently taking his desire to get off the fast track too literally, he went to work for the American Molasses Company, whose name, it must be said, I also did not make up. One last hurrah in American politics beckoned when New York Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia appointed Tugwell chairman of the New York City Planning Commission. Here, too, he ruffled feathers, insisting publicly that his commission was no less than the fourth power of government, news to both Mayor M LaGuardia and Park Commissioner Robert Moses. His options exhausted, Tugwell went south. In 1942, he became the governor of Puerto Rico, having received zero votes and having won no election at the time, the Puerto Rican governorship was an appointed position, and FDR was more than happy to appoint him as far away as possible. <laughs> Some measure of his success there might be surmised by the fact that soon after he left office, the position became an elective one. The people of Puerto Rico insisted on their right to choose their leader. It was then, as the 1950s approached, that Tugwell began having bright ideas. The 20th century was already half over, and as the nation marched toward its 200th birthday, he began to feel that its creaky constitution was nothing to celebrate, really. That our basic laws, inadequate to our modern needs, needed total reassessment, his words. So, much like Alexis de Tocqueville, but exactly the opposite, Tocqueville traveled throughout America to learn his virtues, Tugwell ditched America to catalog its faults, Tugwell began to write a series of articles, which turned into a small library of books, which turned into one heck of a delusion of grandeur, that he, the guy who missed the meeting with Stalin, who had spent years making a sweetener for baked beans, and who was best known as the former governor of Spanish-speaking Puerto Rico, should rewrite the Constitution of the United States of America. A mere 30 years later, he had rewritten our preeminent founding document. No one really noticed. At the time of his death, he was a little-known academic living in Santa Barbara. While I mock his failure, I admire his cojones.
for Rexford Guy Tugwell, agricultural economist, pseudo-communist, actual person, nutball, may have been a misguided crank, yet he tried and failed to do what I have yet only failed to try. <laughs> that ends now. <laughs> Tugwell knew, as I have come to learn, that the Constitution the framers wrote is, as the kids might say, a bit of a hot mess. For starters, think about this. This venerated document doesn't actually mention slavery or democracy or even Facebook pre-IPO. I mean, they could have gotten in early on that, although maybe they, that was wise. It plays favorites among the states, giving Wyoming as many senators as New York or Texas. And I mean, come on. It has typos and misspellings and a smudge that, and this is true, may or may not be a comma, giving, empowering the government to seize your house, depending on which constitutional scholar you ask. It is scrawled with the quill of a goose on the skin of a goat, and its preamble, its most famous introductory passage, was written by a man with a peg leg, which, if you think about it, gives our sacred constitution, wait for it, hardly a leg to stand on. Um, <laughs> yes, technically a peg leg, that is what they called it back then. It is not being politically incorrect. You appreciate that. And again, Emmys, people, plural. Um, <laughs> grown if you must, and perhaps should. But the founders knew all this, too. And by the way, let me just take a step back. You may have read in the statement that my fixed to, in the statement this morning, that my fix to Article 4, which is supposed to help referee disputes between the states, my fix is merely to give up and just rank the states already. Uh, and I rank Texas as number five. Now, I could always change the ranking, people depending on how the rest of tonight's go. So, you know, treat me nice, or Pennsylvania might just leapfrog a few states. That's what I'm saying. You know, just kidding. Where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, George Washington himself. Washington agrees with me about the flaws in the Constitution. It was he who predicted the flawed Constitution would someday become controversial. A child of fortune, he declared, to be fostered by some, but buffeted by others. And lo and behold, it has become a child of fortune, his prediction was absolutely right. Say what you will about George Washington, he may have had wooden teeth, but he had great vision. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, another groaner. You know it's coming. LBJ had some groaners too. So yes, Washington wished it, quote, had been made more perfect. Stomach, uh, Franklin stomached it only, quote, with all its faults. In fact, the speech that Benjamin Franklin gave on the last day of the convention sums up, I think somewhat hilariously, what he, as the oldest and therefore wisest delegate in the room, might have actually really thought about the Constitution. It's a bit of damning with faint praise, and bear with me. Just try to read between the lines on this a little bit. He said, I confess that there are several parts of this Constitution which I do not at present approve, but I am not sure that I will never approve them. <laughs> I doubt when it, whether any other convention we can obtain may be able to make a better constitution. For when you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. From such an assembly, can a perfect production be expected? Thus I consent to this constitution, and this is my favorite phrase, not, uh, thus I consent to the Constitution because I expect no better <laughs> and because I am not sure that it is not the best. <laughs> you might say he sounds like a Republican endorsing Romney. People, people, thank you. I write for The Daily Show, I have to throw a couple of those in there, right? And by the way, when I say that uh, Franklin gave the speech, I don't even mean that. He gave the speech to Delegate James Wilson to give on his behalf. He couldn't really be bothered to get up and say it. Uh, it's the 1787 version of phoning it in a little bit. Um, anyway, because, after all, while we think of our Constitution as the painstakingly designed blueprint drawn up by, yes, an assembly of demigods, the framers in Philadelphia, that assembly of demigods, knew the truth. The Constitution wasn't exactly a blueprint it was as much an etch-a-sketch, a haphazard series of blunders, shaken clean, true, and redrawn dozens of times during a sweltering summer of petty debates, drunken ramblings, wild improvisation, and desperate compromise. Imagine it, they were in Philadelphia in the middle of the summer, in an unventilated room, no AC, wearing powdered wigs, wool coats, 
uh, so you know, pungent. Um, <laughs> they shuttered the windows, they locked the doors for privacy. There was a prison riot across the street. Butchers were throwing animal carcasses into the gutters right outside. So you know, very pungent. Uh, not exactly the best scenario for rational thinking for four months. Um, and to make it all even remotely bearable, and this is true, they were drinking beer for breakfast. Now, admittedly, <laughs> most people drank beer and for breakfast because water was considered unsafe, but nonetheless, they were drinking beer for breakfast. <laughs> In fact, some of them drank so much, I'm looking at you, Luther Martin, that you stood up and gave a six-hour speech rambling that I'm sure you thought was very charming. Anyway, uh, plus, this is interesting, fascinating. By the way, I hope one thing when you, when you read the book, you'll see my true joy in learning just the rollicking four months of this Constitutional Convention. That it is truly an amazing uh, narrative, and I spent a good third of the book at the top, sprinkled in with the executive and the judicial branches and the legislative branch, explaining what happened. Um, but that this, it was truly the most joyful part of the book writing for me. But I, I, that's a digression. I also want to say how it devolved. They adopted two procedural uh, procedural rules at the beginning of the summer that I'm sure seemed like good ideas at the time, but would not be taught in organizational uh, uh, classes at any business school. Um, First, they rejected a motion, quote, to call for the yeas and nays to have them entered into the minutes. In other words, to keep track of what the hell is going on. <laughs> a few delegates, actually, including George Mason, thought that keeping track would be, quote, an obstacle to change of opinions, as if politicians ever needed a reason to change their opinion. They also adopted a so-called committee of the whole that meant that even things that had been voted on and decided on could at any time be revisited and re-voted on by anyone who thought it was worth revisiting or just wanted to play a little political whack-a-mole. You know, so you can imagine the horse trading that went on as the summer wore on. Oh, so that's how you want to design the legislative branch? Okay, well then I take back my suggestions about the judicial. It was truly, truly horse trading. Um, nor is it hard to imagine that by the end of the summer, when some delegates were threatening mutiny and others had just up and left, that they were so sick of each other and so at sea on many of the big decisions that summer that they assigned a smaller group of delegates called the Committee of Style and Arrangement, to actually begin writing the thing at night, <laughs> even though they hadn't really decided what would be in it. Their thought was, just give it a shot, show it to us, if we like it, heck, we might vote on it, you don't know. And actually, ultimately, that's kind of what they did. In fact, you don't really have to imagine it. I haven't given you all the details, but I do spend a good portion of the book accounting for the devolution of the convention, and this is more or less how I sum it up. <clears throat> Now we understand how it all happened, or rather, almost didn't. The Constitution wasn't exactly a miracle at Philadelphia written by an assembly of demigods. On the contrary, what began as a measured, deliberate effort to rescue a beleaguered country became a perpetual, unresolved motion machine, a maddening cycle of non-binding votes by a parade of toothless committees marked by fits and starts, fights and full stops, conducted by a combative group of exhausted, drunken, broke, petty, partisan, scheming, squabbling, bloviating, backstabbing, grandstanding, godforsaken, posturing, restless, cow-tipping, I explained that earlier, <laughs> true, Homesick, cloistered, claustrophobic, sensory deprived, under oxygenated, fed up, talked out, overheated delegates, so distraught and despairing they threatened violence, secession, foreign allegiance, even prayer, and concluded for those who didn't abandon the, the proceedings altogether with, with as much premeditation and forethought as a game of musical chairs. The last, least abhorrent, mutually somewhat acceptable idea on the table when the music stopped or the heat became too unbearable, or the liquor too strong, or the rioting too loud, or the pressure too intense, or the company too loathsome, or the wigs too uncomfortable, or the patients too thin, became the law of the land. <laughs> as much the product of, yes, an assembly of demigods as possibly a confederacy of dunces. From page one, the Confe Constitution is, by its own admission, a great compromise. It is also what you get when you drink beer for breakfast. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, the miracle of Philadelphia isn't that they got the thing written, it's that they didn't write it on the back of a bar napkin, I sometimes wonder. Um, which actually brings me to my occasional drinking companion during the research and writing of this book. One of the more fortunate accidents uh, in this book is getting to have lunch with Justice Scalia. Um, I wanted to meet with Justice Scalia because I thought, you know, who on the face of the planet would really be most amenable to a page one rewrite of the Constitution. <laughs> and I thought certainly it was the man who has devoted his entire life to protecting every word, clause, section 
uh, uh, amendment and article uh, in the thing, especially protecting it from fools like me. Uh, and he is a man, as you know, who does not really suffer fools. Actually, interestingly, he too believes, like Jefferson, that the Constitution is, quote, dead, his words. And he told me as much. The difference is, he means dead as a compliment. <laughs> He means quit trying to revive it. <laughs> quit trying to make it a, a living constitution. Uh, just, he asks you just to remember what it stood for and admire it for its better days, you know, like Frank Sinatra or Greece. <laughs> um, and to my great surprise, yes, he agreed to meet with me. We talked of many things constitutional, but I knew at some point I would have to turn our attentions to the revisions I plan to make in the third article, his bread and butter his gainful employment, the judicial branch. And of course, my proposed change to the Supreme Court possibly revoke lifetime tenure. Of course, that's when he grabbed a fork, pointed at me across that small table and growled, don't you dare, don't you dare revoke lifetime tenure. <laughs> and then added with a bit of a mischievous grin, and if you do, at least grandfather me in. <laughs> because I like my job, he said. Um, and actually, not only does the justice no have a notoriously good sense of humor, um, the Constitution he defends says nothing about lifetime tenure. Uh, it says merely that justices shall serve, and I'm sure some of you in this room know, justices shall serve during, quote, good behavior. And somewhere along the way, early on, and for good reasons that I do address in the book, we chose to interpret that as lifetime tenure. Um, but then I ask, the way I do, must we, should we? And somehow, I, find the, I found the courage, I mustered the courage to, uh, <laughs> to challenge the justice on it. <laughs> and it went like this. I don't bother lecturing Justice Scalia on any of this. After decades of legal study and 25 years of service as one of America's top judges, he's been fully briefed. Instead, I begin my cross-examination. How about you, I ask. How about me what, he counters. Can you imagine just walking away? Of course I can, he scoffs, with a couldn't care less tone that implies he'd just as soon leave today if he hadn't just signed a two-year lease on a Supreme Court locker. <laughs> when, I ask. Like I've said before, as soon as I'm not firing on all eight cylinders, when I'm not doing the job as well as I used to, it'll be time to go. How will you know when that is? He looks me straight in the eye. I'll know. You're treading on thin ice, counselor, <laughs> I'm thinking. So you don't need some outside authority limiting the term of your service. I'm fairly aware of the requirements of the position, he says. I'll know when I can no longer fulfill them. Like I said, thin ice. And yet, what if I told you, Your Honor, that someone even more powerful than you says you're wrong about that? Very thin ice. And who is that? Someone you know quite well. He looks at me, wondering if he should ask. Who? If this were a case in some courtroom drama, this is the moment when I would stand slowly, scan the jury, look back at the judge, and call on my surprise witness. May it please the court, I shall now call to the stand, dramatic pause, the current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. If this were indeed a courtroom drama, the double doors in the back of the room would fly open, the stenographer would record the reaction of the gallery, audible gasps, and Chief Justice John G. Roberts, Jr. would saunter up the aisle, hesitating only long enough to lock eyes with fellow Justice Scalia and feel his glare, et tu, Roberte. <laughs> Roberts would then explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that no matter what he says or how he pleads for mercy, Justice Antonin Scalia should have been kicked off the court exactly 10 years ago. Back in real life, I explain what the hell I'm talking about. When he was a lawyer in the Reagan White House, 22 years before he joined the Supremes, John Roberts argued on behalf of a 15-year term limit for Supreme Court justices. It was both a pragmatic proposal, as he saw it, the founders, quote, adopted life tenure at a time when people simply did not live as long as they do now, and a principled one for many of the reasons I've trotted out. Quote, a judge insulated from the normal currents of life for 25 or 30 years was a rarity then, but is becoming commonplace today, he wrote in a White House memo. Setting a term of, say, 15 years would ensure that federal judges would not lose all touch with reality through decades of ivory tower existence. 
it is an indictment of lifetime tenure too compelling to ignore. As I finish explaining this, one thing is clear. Scalia knew nothing of this. <laughs> is that so, he asks? Roberts thought that? I have outlawed the longest serving associate justice of the Supreme Court. <laughs> really? He thought that, he asks again. Yes, I say, pausing a beat for dramatic effect. Yes, he did. For a moment, Scalia seems speechless. He can muster no defense. Even though we're sitting in the National Gallery, not the Supreme Court, and eating lunch, not arguing case law, I am tempted to shout, the prosecution rests, slam an imaginary briefcase, and march out triumphantly. But I don't. I stay. And Scalia's grin returns. Well, he says, I doubt he does any more. <laughs> He has a good point. Roberts doesn't think that anymore. When Roberts himself was asked about his previous comments at his confirmation hearings in 2005, he flip-flopped. Predictably, his perspective on the issue had evolved. As the law professor Larry Sabato has eloquently put it, on the issue of lifetime tenure, where one stands depends on where one sits. <laughs> Scalia's joke seems to put him back on the offense. So, he asks, so, um, it was an argument that it's time to be before. So what? So, are you going to make me retire with your new constitution? I mean, I've been here longer than 15 years. Oh, he's not on the attack. He's throwing himself at the mercy of my court. <laughs> no, sir. I'm not here to fire Justice Scalia, though I appreciate his acknowledgement of my authority to do so. <laughs> so what exactly do you propose? I thought he'd never ask. Simple, I say. Your new Article 3, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, I'm doing my best to speak in cursive, and the judges shall hold their offices during good behavior. Scalia seems confused, but that's what Article 3 already says, he says. Not exactly, I clarify. I dropped the U from behavior to make it more American. <laughs> <clears throat> but otherwise, that's Article 3 of the Constitution. Indeed it is, Your Honor, indeed it is. It was, I was certain, a remedy for Article Three that an originalist like Justice Scalia could not help but support. We take it literally. We revive the original article and we honor its original language. Judges shall hold their offices during good behavior. Surely a dyed in the parchment originalist wouldn't mind a stricter adherence to the text of the original, the virgin article, the genuine article, before it was corrupted over decades of convenient interpretations by let's say, self-serving and self-preserving justices of all political stripes who, and these are true stories, st uh, stayed too long on the court merely to spite a president or will away a stroke or stave off a retirement of pinochle and shuffleboard, not exactly good behavior. The founders never declared explicitly that good behavior necessarily meant for life, so why, on this occasion only, would an originalist throw his lot in with ugh, living constitutionalists? eager to blend, bend the Constitution to their will. Wouldn't a died in the parchment originalist want to be compelled to honor the uh, Constitution's original language, to play it as it lays? I had him dead to rights. Surely he, a man who swore by the letter of the law, would swear by the letter of this law, that is, save one letter, to which he owed his entire career. I have to say I was pretty proud of my judicial jujitsu. But who determines good behavior, he asks. Good behavior, I correct him. He was pronouncing the U. <laughs> That's what I said, he says. Who gets to decide? I've anticipated this question. Scalia listens closely as I propose a judging body composed of three people appointed by the president whose sole responsibility is to determine whether the justices are passing the good behavior test as revived by my new constitution. He gets what I'm aiming at. A supreme Supreme Court, he says with a laugh. Scalia is evidently amused by the idea. I can tell he's not ruling it out. Just one question, he says. I raise my chin and allow it. Yes, Your Honor. How long do they serve? <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Um, so now that I hope I've justified this book's existence to Justice Scalia, <laughs> 
and to you here at the LBJ Library, and to the ghosts of Hamilton and Madison. I know you're out there somewhere. Uh, let me conclude with this thought before I, I take what I hope will be a few of your softball questions. Um, you're probably asking yourself, all right, sounds great, Kevin, but does the world really need yet another book about a man who single-handedly rewrites the Constitution by himself? I mean, Tugwell and now you, enough, really. <laughs> um, and I would say to you, oh, you bet it does. Because, ladies and gentlemen, patriots and patriots, the Constitution is hot, like 50 shades of gray hot. <laughs> People are constantly quoting it, even though they haven't read it. People are hiding behind it, even though they're not quite sure what it says. And as a piece of literature, the only thing that would make the Constitution hotter was if James Madison were a vampire. <laughs> it's so popular that right now, somewhere in America, a thousand tea partiers are misquoting it. It's so amazing that somewhere Kanye West is interrupting an acceptance speech to insist that it should have won. It's so exciting that somewhere Anthony Weiner is tweeting pics of himself having just read it. That's for the, okay, there we go. <laughs> Which is why, on behalf of America, that was for the back of the room. I appreciate that one. Thank you. <laughs> Which is why, on behalf of America, I have paid every price, bore every burden, met every hardship, and saved every receipt in my quest to assure its survival. And why now, you ask? Well, ladies and gentlemen, at a time when Michelle Bachman believes the battles of Lexington and Concord were fought in New Hampshire, at a time when Sarah Palin believes Paul Revere made his midnight ride to warn the British that we were armed. <laughs> At a time when, and this is true, John Boehner believes we hold these truths to be self-evident is his favorite part of the preamble to the Constitution, even though it's in the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> At a time when we have no reason to believe James Madison wasn't a vampire, it shouldn't be too hard to believe this, that I, Kevin Blyer, Sure, I'm the most qualified man to rewrite the Constitution of the United States. Uh, as John Stewart said, think of it as 50 shades of red, white, and blue. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope that while you're still part of the union, you get out there and you help me ratify it. Thank you very much. Happy to take some questions about anything I might not have addressed so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. If any of you have questions, I will happily hear it, try to recite it, and uh, so everyone can hear. Please, yes, in the front row right here. Right. Right, true reparations, I understand. Um, I'm flattered that you call me a rich white man. If this book sells, sure, why not, right? How many copies you want to buy? Um, but yes, I addressed that. I addressed a number of things. I mean, as you know, depending on your perspective, uh, you might argue that the Constitution has made great gains <laughs> uh, across the board, from voting rights to every representation to everything. Um, uh, and I actually, speaking, we're in the great place right here, LBJ, you know, with the Voting Rights Act, for that matter. Um, as you know, he's, he knew that the Constitution could withstand it. Um, and so I argue about why we should embrace our, our right to vote, and all of us should, of course, get, to right, get the right to vote. I make some comic hay out of rather ridiculous, I think, proposals about extending the Voting Rights Act to kind of its ridiculous extremes. There are those out there in the world, and maybe some of you are here today, so forgive me if I say it, that believe that, say, uh, mothers should get to, the, uh, get to vote for as many children as they plan to have, that kind of thing. <laughs> plan to have, I'm not kidding. Not just pregnant, though I get two, but plan to have. I'm gonna have a family of five, so looking ahead, I really should get five votes. Um, so there, you can go too far with these things, but I think that we can all agree that, that we've made the right gains as far as representation, uh, as, far, as far as treating people like humans. Uh, you know, the, the fatal flaw of the Constitution has been uh, luckily you know, amended, um, and uh, I think we all know what I'm referring to, and so that's a great thing. So. Um, but yes, buy the book, and it'll go right into my coffers, and then I can be that rich man that you, you claim I am. Appreciate that. Please, right in the front row. Besides being a comedy writer, who is your... There's nothing besides being a comedy writer. <laughs> that's, that's all... Oh, sure. I wanted to be... This is a real journalist. Yes. I wanted to be a real journalist. I had these grand designs of being actually a war correspondent in some far-flung region, you know, I wanted to be a stringer in Beirut. I thought that was a very romantic thing to do. Um, and, I, and I didn't give up the ghost on that real quick. I, in fact, I would even argue that I still haven't. But I will tell you what kind of an amusing thing that's come to pass. The question was, besides being, forgive me, the, besides being a comedy writer, what did I actually want to do? When I, what, did I, what did I major in in school? For example, I majored in journalism. Um, and uh, 
And my brother, my older brother is a, an anchor man, sports anchor, um, and he seemed to enjoy his gigs, so I thought maybe I'll do something similar. But I wanted to go even more far flung, like I said, across the world and report wars and what have you. It amuses me that I got waylaid from that. I did work in London for just shy of a year, and I thought maybe that's the leapfrog. I was working for public radio at the time, American public radio. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, maybe I'll go there. But instead, I found myself moving to Los Angeles, and I got a job as a satirical writer on Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher, uh, 1996, 97. And, um, and I was still thinking I want to go off and be a war correspondent someday. And forgive me for a bit of a digression, but I will say that after that show was canceled, I actually went to Showtime, a cable channel, and sold a show that, that I would be the host of. Um, and, in our, in the, and they bought it, and we, and we made the pilot. didn't go to series, but in that pilot, I, it's March 2003, and we were just, it was, the Iraq War was just you know, launched. And I was, you may remember the actual news. This is a bit of a satirical, topical talk show. Much, it, I would say it was, a, it was a, an early, bad, or a worse version of, uh, of the Colbert Report. Uh, but um, in, that, in that show, um, I should take one step back and say the news of that week was that they were strapping cameras onto dolphins to search the perimeters of aircraft carriers, or they were planning to. I don't know if you heard about this. They didn't want to repeat the USS Cole bombing and what have you. So in my pilot, I was an embedded correspondent in the Iraq war, but I wasn't embedded from a CNN or from MSNBC. I was embedded from the animal planet there to make sure that <laughs> no tanks crushed any lemurs and what have you. So I, I was pretending to be a war correspondent in a far-flung real war for a you know, cable channel, but then cut for four years later, um, I'm working for The Daily Show and I've been there for a few years, and I, we go to Iraq. And I, I and Rob Riggle go to Iraq for two weeks. So oddly enough, I went from wanting to be a real war correspondent to pretending to be a war correspondent on a fake show to actually going and being a war correspondent, so to speak, for a fake television show. <laughs> um, it, the levels of meta, I'm still trying to work my head around. Um, you know, we traded the green screen for the green zone for a little bit, and uh, and frankly, went at a time that other news. It was right during the surge, August 2007. We went at a time when there weren't a lot of other networks going there. So the, even the soldiers there were saying, you know, you guys are doing a little more work right now in this month than other people have come by in a while. You know, um, it was an honor, I gotta say. Uh, yes, please, if we work our way back. Uh oh, I can tell it's gonna be a hardball. Here we go. <laughs> go. In 19 years, like Thomas Jefferson told me to, <laughs> I have to. I don't have a choice. Yes. <laughs> Taxes come. <laughs> sure. Send it along. Yeah. Now, Texas the state or Texas the country? <laughs> Which one are you going to ask me to touch? Um, it's funny. People have asked what, what document I might do next. Um, and there are a bunch of options, although part of me thinks that I will probably have to rewrite the Federalist Papers just to justify what I've done here <laughs> in the same way that the Federalist Papers were to justify the Constitution in the first place to try to get everybody to ratify it. I might have to, I have some splaining to do, I think, as part of it, you know, comic splaining, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll keep working back in the aisle here. Yes, please. In the study of the uh, Constitution, we call it me search. Yes, go on, yes. It's an interesting question. Um, and first of all, um, I don't pretend to know all the answers. I just pretend to know all the answers. <laughs> so can I give you a straight out yes or no? I can't, but I do address it a little bit. I go all the way back to 1792, I believe, when, when George Washington uh, had the Militia Act and insisted that everyone have to, act, have to buy a gun, um, because I believe that's one of the cases that they're actually using to determine this. Um, so I say there is some precedent for it. It's not so far afield to assume that the Commerce Clause might actually have a say in whether or not we should all be forced to, uh, to, to you know, pay for our health care whether or not we want to. Um, I don't come out on either side of that for that, actual, that article um, that addresses the Commerce Clause, but I will say um, that, uh, I lost my train of thought, um, oh, I know what it was. Essentially, what I do with each of these articles, and I hope this is where there's some utility here, is that I do address the issues. I do address what people have debated about what might be wrong or right with each article and amendment, um, and get to the nub of it, and then, of course, go out on my flights of fancy as far as what I think the ridiculous, absurd solution would be. But I do address the, that, that particular issue. I will, I will admit that I don't 
come out on one side or the other because I'm not, even though I pr pretend to be a Supreme Court justice, I'm not actually one. Um, and I'll let them def define that. So forgive the punt on that particular one. Yeah, indeed. Please, right here. <laughs> Happy to answer that. Um, I would say it's classified. People have asked, well, which jokes did you write? Now that's classified. We can't. That is the speech writer slash joke writer's code. I would never claim which ones are mine. But it's it's an honor. I mean, I will tell you, I, I've you know I've written for a lot of really established comedians, um, Bill Maher, Dennis Miller, John Stewart, others. Um, and it, it's always a thrill to see someone nail it and get the joke. And it, first of all, enjoy the joke, but then also go in front of an audience and say it. And um, I don't, you know, there was a great article you might have seen a week and a half ago in, in the New York Times that Dick Cavett wrote about giving away all of his best material and seeing other people and whether or not, he would always get asked, do you resent it? Do you want to be up there doing it? And it's like, no, I, this is the best of all possible worlds. I get to make sure, I get to sit behind the screen and watch people enjoy my jokes and let somebody else fail if it fails. <laughs> but, but to answer that more directly about the president, of course it's an honor. I can remember the first time he said something of mine. Um, and I was actually not at the, that particular event, I was at home, and I was reading kind of a live, live blog, and sure, I gave out a bit of a yelp, like, wow, that happened. I've seen it a bunch of times now in person, of course, and it's a thrill. What I love about him um, as a showman is that he's really good at it. Um, he has that ability to not only know that he's enjoy to let people know that he's enjoying himself, but he does that thing <laughs> where as the laughter, if it's either boisterous or not, dies down, he does that little, <laughs> which makes you know that he enjoyed it as well. I will also tell you, I'll confide in you, say that one of my jokes did not go over very well, and I kind of had a hunch it wasn't going to. It was a little bit too inside baseball for even that inside baseball crowd that was at the radio and TV correspondence dinner. And, um, and, uh, and he did all I would ever want him to do, which is when the joke got very little laugh, um, he kind of looked around, said, I like that joke. <laughs> I'll, I, I'll, I need an audience of one, and they, if that's, that's all I need. If you ever had just an audience of one and that was enough, it would be the President of the United States. <laughs> yes, it's a pleasure, it's true, yeah, indeed. And, yes, in the back, please. Do you address the jokes? I do address it. Um, one, it's in the, in, first of all, in the, the fourth article in which, as I said, that's the article which kind of suggests that the states need to find some way to get along, and that it's supposed to referee uh, the, the um, the, you know, any kind of uh, disagreements between the states. Now, granted, what I do is say, yes, if you're allowed to get gay married in Massachusetts, does that mean it should be recognized in other states? If you want to have assisted suicide in Oregon, does that mean it should be recognized in other states or medical marijuana or just marijuana for that matter? Um, and since we're getting more divided, more, po more polarized, but I also al would also suggest that I believe in an America that states are separate and individual and kind of interesting in their own ways. So. There's, it is getting harder to referee among the states um, because we're getting to the nub of some very significant issues that we might that the founders would never have foreseen. I don't think you can actually look back and say Ta Je Jefferson or Washington definitely addressed gay marriage. <laughs> they didn't. So it's it's kind of ridiculous to say, well, what did they say about it? Um, but. Uh, to again punt just a little bit, what I do is say, okay, we have these other, we have these problems among the states. That is to say, we don't agree on every issue, and we're disagreeing on more and more issues every day. The only way we could actually do this without another civil war of, over something minor <laughs> uh, is to go ahead and rank the states top to bottom. So I say, <laughs> you know, New York number one. Come, I'm from New York. Texas number five goes all the way down to poor Rhode Island. Um, <laughs> Now, I've gotten a little bit of guff about this to take a little bit of digression here, too. I, they excerpted part of my book in which I kind of lean into Nebraska and didn't quite explain that it was a bit of an arbitrary decision why I made fun of Nebraska so ruthlessly. That They also didn't get to the point where I make fun of Rhode Island so ruthlessly, and it's not arbitrary at all. Rhode Island deserves my disdain, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Rhode Island, the tiniest state in the Union, has historically been the biggest pain in the butt, and we can all admit it, they never showed up at the Constitutional Convention, they only ratified it at the very end when they know it was Me Tooism, when they knew they'd get left behind. Every step of the way for the first 30 years of, the, of, the, of, of America, they were dragging their heels. So for that reason alone, I say how dare you. Um, but yeah, but I do address gay, gay marriage, and in fact, that's part of the chapter about where I lean into Nebraska, because I said, well, what, what, if I, what if I had just gotten gay married and I wanted these states that I was driving through to recognize it? Do I have to wait till the honeymoon to get to San Francisco? Um, it is a fair question. Um, 
and uh, you know, and I think that as we go forward, that's we're going to have more and more of these kind of very complex issues that are harder to answer every day. Which, as you can see, I just talked for five minutes and I didn't answer you. Pretty impressive. <laughs> Pretty impressive. You got to admit, I should run for president. I should be a politician now, right? I don't know how much time we have more. A couple more, please, in the back. Yes, I promise to work back. So, please. Uh, the exits are like a couple places. No. I. Okay. Yes. My changes. I have a kind of a hunch that this won't be ratified anytime soon. Um, I mean, I think the best way to answer that is that it's almost impossible to make changes to the Constitution. Um, James Madison himself, the man who authored the Constitution, who had reason to kind of have a pride of authorship and pride of ownership, in his later life was surprised that even then there had been so few amendments. And even though we look and say 27 amendments, that's, that's, a, that's a beefy number. It's actually not that many when you compare it to other constitutions around the world. It's very hard to amend the Constitution to get two-thirds of states and three-quarters of legislatures to get, to get behind an actual constitution. Yeah, and to have a constitutional convention, I think it's been, it's been called for a number of times, but it just never, it never happened, and I don't expect that it will. Um, smarter people than I have... have have devised ways that it might, um, but you know we've had no no amendments in the in the well the 21st millennium. <laughs> uh, we've had there, a handful, but a lot of scholars say they tinker at the margins in the 20th century. Um, third millennium amendment, um, and then of course a lot of the a lot of the amendments after the Civil War were admittedly we had some housekeeping to do, so that was ma makes a lot of sense. Um, but that's. That's amendments. You're asking for a wholesale rewrite of the Constitution. Uh, I can't imagine that it, at a time when you know people can't even people in Washington can't even agree on getting together for lunch. Uh, there's no chance that there's going to be any kind of real wholesale. Uh, you know, not to be a pessimist. I think there are actually Sandy Levinson probably more optimistic about it if he's here. Um, that maybe something can be done. But I, I kind of think that this the best chance I have is for at least to make some jokes about it and bring some attention to it. Yes, right here, and then we'll go back there. Um, so if we can move on maybe not so carefully, I have a pretty common bone with uh, people running for president. Yes. Which would you have more fun with, Romney? <laughs> well, you know what? I'm not lamenting the fact that Romney is the nominee right now. <laughs> um, because, especially, and it's funny, I, you're probably talking about The Daily Show, but for this book exp especially, I don't know if you saw this. A week and a half ago, he was in Las Vegas. Um, it was the day, I think, or two weeks ago, yeah. The day he was going to meet with uh, Trump. Um, and he gave a speech in the afternoon in which he said, I take his word, that he had met with a businessman. And the businessman sidled up to him and said, you know what? I think we should uh, add a provision to the Constitution, which I guess he means amendment, but he didn't want to say provision, is suggesting that anyone who runs for the president there shouldn't be just age requirements or birth, nation of birth requirements or citizenship requirements. There should be a requirement that every presidential candidate must have had three years of business experience. And this is Romney saying this. Granted, he threw it off on the businessman, but he was trying to throw it out there as an idea. And I thought, how clever of him, because, yeah, why not? Reduce the number of people eligible to be president until it only describes you. <laughs> it's kind of a genius move on Romney's part. And I actually remember thinking, Perfect for me, perfect for this, because that's the kind of absurd suggestion you might have read about in my book, <laughs> in which I absurdly rewrite the Constitution absurdly, and here he is actually doing it. Um, and then I also was amused just a couple of days ago when he said that he would, he's, he's considering foregoing a salary for president, and that's fine, because he did that, as I understand, for Ma Massachusetts governor and for uh, when he ran the Olympics or saved the Olympics. Um, but, uh, but then he said, what I might consider doing is having an incentive system where if I get certain things done, I get paid accordingly. <laughs> I just thought, that, is he, can he, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, if that's the case, he better be bold. He said, if I balance the budget, 50 billion come my way. Because <laughs> comparatively, 50, if I saved you 3 trillion, come, I get 50 billion of it. I just want him to say that if he really means incentive system. He's gonna, president on commission? Is that what we're doing now? <laughs> 
So there's plenty of comic hay out there. I mean, but yeah, that was, there were, yeah, you, you have to miss a lot of those Republican uh, primary uh, candidates as well. Yeah, there's a gentleman named Rick Perry that I had heard of. <laughs> there's, and there's three reasons I would love for him to be there. One, he's hilarious. Second, he's a comic character. And th the third one, what was the third one? <laughs> Oops. I don't know. It's only but a goodie. All right. Uh, yes, in the front, please. And then, and then back there. Listenership for our pod, you may have to guess a blue ribbon commission to implement it. Okay. Do you have anyone in mind? Who would you appoint? Uh, I don't know yet. A blue ribbon commission. Blue ribbon that's, ribbon usually, ribbon. that's usually the solution to most things. A committee. That's usually the best way to get something done in Washington, right? The question that I really want to know is what is your original written on, written with, and what's the script? My original? Well, this you're going to laugh about this, I think, a little bit. I, um, we would, you mean, as far as the book, it's all written in the book, and granted, I wrote it on a laptop, but, because, you know, I gotta, I gotta update it. Well, we, yeah, well, it, yeah, well, I, here's what I will say to that. Um, as a bit of a digression, we talked about many, because we talked about, you know, the handwriting on the quill, of, with the quill of a goose on a, in the skin of a goat and what have you, and um, if you go, by the way, to the National Archives, and you really should, it's kind of fascinating to see the original documents. Um, a lot of them are very faded. Uh, faded. Um, you really can't read much of the Declaration of Independence. Um, but I did go, in fact, and read it. Uh, you know, because a lot of people can say they have read the Constitution, but how many people can actually say they stood there for 45 minutes and read the actual National Archives document as six-year-olds are elbowing you and the docent is saying, you really have to move along. So I kept coming back, coming back, and coming back. Anyway. Um, uh, it's a lot, it's hard to read, and so how, obviously I would think you'd have to put it into something that would be um, microfiche, I don't know, what would you do that would stand the test of time? But um, what I, one thing I will say about my, this actual book and the font that we kind of went back and forth on, how, how, how calligraphic did we want this font to be and where and how, and it was a long discussion, and then I kind of landed on a font that I really liked, um, and I forget the name of it, starts with a C, and we kept it for a while, and then I realized the reason I liked it so much, it was the same font on all the, on all the Les Mis posters. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> I can't use it anymore. I love Les Mis, but I can't do it anymore. T that was a total digression, forgive me. Um, yeah, we'd have to do it digitally. Come on now, it's the 21st century, right? Uh, please, in the back. Very timely question, in fact. Um, yeah, I mean, I do say a little bit that, you know, first of all, the founders expected a lot of people to move to the country. They did. They knew they were going to set up something amazing. Um, the, granted, it was a land grab at the time, but the Louisiana Purchase was something that Thomas Jefferson did specifically because he knew that this was going to be such a, you know, a, a, a place that the world would want to live, that he needed more people, more, more land to do it. Um, granted, he did it at the time when he knew himself that that was something that was extra constitutional. He knew that it was actually violating the Constitution in, in that, which is amusing. I actually give a full litany of ways that we've challenged the Constitution. He said, I did it for your own good. I did it for the good of the country. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, I don't think I'm addressing it directly, but I think that this is a melting pot. I mean, this is obviously a the, the shining city on the hill, all those things that people want to live here. Um, and I think that we have to be rational about making sure that people who are here can stay here in ways that they, you know, can contribute to the society and, and enjoy the blessings of, this, of the country. To be serious for a moment, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please, right there. Right. Yeah. And oddly enough, in France, having a delightful time with 19-year-olds, as I recall. <laughs> so it's funny that he thought that every generation, every 19 years is the right round number <laughs> to bring, you know, I think, you know, every 19 years we really give it to the new generation, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so what I wanted to ask is, can you discuss the, the impact of the Constitution on the Mm-hmm. That's why I hang my hat on him. I'm doing something a bit outlay. <laughs> I would say I rely on him for the, the overall argument of what I'm doing, which is precisely rewriting the Constitution. I mean, he's the one who said do it. 
Um, but I don't think, I think I do give full credence to a lot of uh, people that would utterly disagree with him. Adams, Hamilton, a bunch of people. Um, and I, you know, I address their concerns when they apply to the formulation of the executive branch, the formulation of the legislature, et cetera. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, as much as one can in, in a book that's trying to cover every base of every amendment and article, I, I cherry pick when I have to, but that's what I get to do as a comedy writer. <laughs> but yeah, I do, I do, I think I do give full uh, credence to voices from all, uh, all sides. Um, effectively, that's up to people who read it and decide. I could take a couple more questions, I suppose, yeah? Um, well, right here, in the, please. Yes. What level of trust do you hope this book will have? <clears throat> I don't want to give away the ending, <laughs> but I will. Uh, the butler didn't do it, in my estimation. That is to say, I do, to some degree, I, we know this about the Constitution. We know that um, one in four Americans really ever, having, ever remember having read it. We know that more Americans can recite the Three Stooges than the three branches of government. <laughs> We know, as we know, John Boehner believes we hold these truths to be self-evident, is, is, is in the Constitution rather than the Declaration. There are other ridiculous kind of egregious blind spots that we all have uh, at, in the Constitution. I do not hold myself separate from that. I'm sure if you had asked me a number of discrete questions about the Constitution, if you said, how did the Constitution begin? I may have just as well told you uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> My point being that I'm not trying to suggest that I'm only a paragraph ahead of the reader in learning about this, but what I hope I can do with the book is bring them along so that they find it as interesting as I did, so that they go back to the source code, read a little bit more, understand what's in it. Um, so at the very least, the public service, if I can, uh, that I might be suggesting to the world with this is to uh, uh, go back, reread it. You don't have to go to the National Archives. I do enough of a, a job in the book to kind of give you kind of the point, the, you know, the mile markers about where you might want to learn it. But um, if nothing else, to kind of inspire a new interest in the Constitution among, hey, even the kids, right? So there we go, yes. Oh, please, last question, I suppose, yes. Uh, is there anything to your reverence for the Constitution? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, look, I, I will read one more chapter. Um, it, no, not a full chapter, but it's, the reason I can say I'll read a chapter is because it's very short. Um, there's, I mean, there, there are, you can't, there are difficult things that you kind of have to address. Um, well, then you know, I'll read two quick little passages here. One is a chapter that I think might address what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> um, for example, uh, your new amendment addressing slavery. What the? Involuntary servitude? We actually did that? That's terrible. Let's not do that. That's how I address that, for example. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but I will just finish with this. I began, I began with, the, uh, argue, with the story about their beloved bell being in jeopardy at the top. Um, I will end with the, with the last little bit. This doesn't, give, this doesn't um, spoil it for you, I promise, but uh, this is how the last, it's the coda. Their beloved stamp was in jeopardy. It had been designed carefully and artfully, graced not only with the stately visage of an adored and enduring national icon, but also with the denomination chosen to reflect just how long it would last, nay, how long it should last forever. It was 2011, 125 years after the statue it featured had been dedicated as a gift from France as a memorial to independence, liberty, enlightening the world. And to honor her long journey across seas and centuries, three billion stamps had been printed by the patriots at the United States Postal Service. Two billion had already been issued, countless licked or peeled and stuck and sent far across town, across the country, and across the globe to enlighten one world, one, excuse me, to enlighten the world one envelope at a time. Alas, forever wouldn't last forever. One eagle-eyed philatelist, armed only with a jeweler's loop, a rabid obsession with detail, and way too much time on his hands, made a shocking discovery. The lady on the stamp wasn't the 305-foot copper and iron neoclassical figure standing sentry on an island in the New York Harbor. No, sir. The lady on the stamp was the pint-sized knockoff on the Las Vegas Strip, overlooking not New York, New York, but the New York, New York Casino. <laughs> she hadn't welcomed the huddled masses yearning to breathe free in the new world. She welcomed obsessive gamblers yearning to sidle up to the $3.99 all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> Less the stuff of immigrants' hopes and dreams, a real-life liberty, more the stuff of fiberglass and styrofoam, a replica Lady Luck. In other words, we've got three billion of these, 
A small discolored rectangle that mars her crown's most prominent center spike, the real lady wouldn't be caught dead with such a blemish, was the telltale giveaway. Somewhere, someone had merely raided a stock photography service and thought, yeah, that seems about right. It must be her. And if it's not, no one will notice. Well, someone noticed. Once alerted to its gaffe, the United States Postal Service released an official statement, but not of apology, of adoration. We still love the stamp design, they said, and would have selected the photograph anyway. They admitted no defeat, made no excuses, announced no recall. They also, it must be said, made me proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free to pretend I totally meant to do that. <laughs> even when I totally screwed up. <laughs> After all, what was the Postal Service to do? Should it deny it made a mistake, as original author James Madison might have wished in that summer of 1787, and as originalist Anton Scalia would still advise today? Should it recall the stamp and continue living the past? That was the unfortunate choice Jonathan Dayton made in the later years when he, the youngest dele delegate at the Constitutional Convention, stayed so fixated on his participation in Philadelphia that he never once updated even his manner of dress, the last of the cocked hats, they called him, a walking example of arrested development. Should it waste decades redesigning every feature of the imperfect stamp, following in the footsteps of nutball, <laughs> of nutball Guy Tugwell, who everyone knows is a nutball who wasted decades redesigning every feature of the Constitutional Constitution, or should it make it a bold, wholesale makeover in a staggering, miraculous flurry of glorious inspiration, as I, Kevin Blyer, your hero and humble servant, have done in these pages? Even if it should, it didn't. Instead of promising a more perfect stamp, the Postal Service insisted the stamp was a more perfect stamp, one that, despite the injuries and usurpations brought on by a sloppy postal researcher, still secures the blessings of the liberty as we know her, life-size and in full. It interpreted the advice of Thomas Jefferson that we not look at stamps or anything really with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant and of James Madison too, that we not suffer a blind veneration for antiquity and something slightly different, that we should just get over ourselves, stick with the program and meet up at the craps table, baby needs a new pair of shoes. <laughs> Again, a lesson. The lesson shines forth and the lesson shines forth as bright and unmistakable as the flame in Lady Liber Liberty's outstretched hand. Sometimes, in order to honor an icon that defines us as a nation, whether it be a giant, giant green woman holding a torch or a constitution of the United States of America, we all have to just roll with what we've got because it's still pretty damn awesome. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Hey.